everybody. Hi, guys. Uh, most of you guys know me, but in case you don't, I'm Candace Sava. I happen to be married to this evening's author, and I'm pinch hitting for Bill Harmer, who, who was called away tonight. So um, I just wanted to mention, first of all, thank everyone so much for coming. And uh, it's really special to Dan and I that we're having this event tonight at the Westport Library. We both have been very involved here for many years. Dan served on the board of the library, and I've uh, been working on the Book for the Evening event for I don't know how many years maybe 15 at this point. So the library is a really central part of our lives and we're just thrilled to have you all with us tonight to talk about Dan's new book. Um, okay, so tonight Dan uh, Gross, the author, is going to be in conversation about his new book um, with Gabrielle Rosenfeld. So first I'm gonna uh, introduce Gav. Um, fun fact, Gav and Dan, our very longtime friends, they went to summer camp together as children. Uh, Gav lives down in Greenwich. He's a graduate of Brown University and received his PhD at UCLA, and he's been teaching at Fairfield University for more than 20 years. Um, he's one of the leading historians working today in the field of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, counterfactual history, and the Jewish experience. And his most recent book is The Fourth Reich, the Specter of Nazism from World War II to the Present. And he's currently co-editing a timely new book on fascism in America. And this fall, Gav uh, added a new role to his CV, and he is the new president of the Center for Jewish History in New York, which is uh, the parent for several Jewish organizations. And it houses the world's largest and most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel and supports research, exhibitions, and events. And we thought Gav would be the perfect person to talk with Dan about Edmund Safra, who obviously is well known as a banker, but as you'll hear, is a very well known Jewish philanthropist as well. So Gav, come on up. Yeah. So about uh, tonight's author, Dan Gross, has been writing about developments in the global economy and, fi and finance for more than 30 years. He's been a columnist at the New York Times and Newsweek Magazine, among other places, and is the author of eight previous books. But I will say, this is the only one that's been blurbed by the likes of Michael J. Fox and Elton John. Um, he's lived here in Westport since 2002. Uh, he asked me to mention that in his younger years, he, he posted respectable times in the Westport Summer Road Race series. But now, <laughs> in middle age, he's turned to bicycling, so I'm just gonna put a plug in. Please do not hit him with your car. And uh, tonight, he's here to discuss his latest book, A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. So please welcome my husband. <clears throat> Are we all mic'd? Yeah. Good. So thanks everybody uh, for coming. Candy was uh, actually being 100% honest in pointing out that Dan and I, uh, we go back, in fact, to the fair year 1982. So we're celebrating 40 years now of friendship. Uh, tell, Camp Tell Yehuda in Barryville, New York. And what I wanted to just begin by saying is that this book, um, to me, is, is wonderful in all kinds of ways, but it's got a brisk narrative, it's analytical, and it's very personal. So when I first met Dan in 1982, I knew him as the guy from East Lansing, Michigan, not as the guy who had a very complex personal history with Syrian ancestry that was going to find its expression in this new study. Uh, so I think, as we'll uh, find in our conversation today, this is fairly... <coughs> You know, is it accurate to say this is maybe your most personal book? Probably the only one, yeah. Okay. Um, so you write that you were born to write this book. Uh, what do well, you mean by that? Actually, when I showed Candy the first couple chapters, she said, you were born to write this book. And, you know, I spent a lot of my time uh, when I was younger, especially traveling as much as I could looking for a story. And sometimes, you know, if you're lucky, the story finds you where you are. Um, you know, professionally, I studied business history. I've written a lot about this stuff. I've spent the last 30 years as a business journalist. 
writing about global financial developments. Um, as a columnist in the New York Times, I've written books. I've interviewed a lot of CEOs and billionaires, um, Warren Buffett, Alan Greenspan, et cetera. So that's one qualification that would let me construct the story of somebody who was very active in the second half of the 20th century in, you know, started banks on three continents and was involved, like, personally creating financial globalization. So, but, you know, a banker is, is what Edmund Safra was. Yeah, so if that's what he was, what about the who question? Who was Edmund Safra? It's a big question, but who was he? Well, it's a complicated one because he, was, he would tell you he was a Syrian Jew, but he was born in Beirut and never lived in Syria. Um, he was a citizen of Brazil, resident of Geneva and Monaco, had houses in Paris and London and New York, and really identified with the U.S. in many ways. Um, and, you know, the fact that he was a Syrian Jew is kind of what got me in the door. So the name Gross is a kind of classic Ashkenazi name. My father, right there, <laughs> is a Jewish, nice Jewish boy who went to Bronx Science and CCNY and Ashkenazi to his core. Um, but his parents had died when he was very young, long before I was born. He really was only child, so we really had no family on that side. And the family we had was my mother's family. And my mother, who is also here. <laughs> and her name is Sandra Nasser. And they are Syrian Jews from Brooklyn. And my grandparents, who were very you know, close to us, had, um, <clears throat> you know, they each had eight or nine brothers and sisters. They all lived in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And they went to Deal in the summer. And, you know, these were not Goldbergs and Schwartzes. These were Sitz and Dwecks and Nassers. And they didn't curse or say nice things to you in Yiddish, they did it in Arabic. And they didn't eat matzo ball soup, we had kibbe and hummus. Mm -hmm. Like this was, you know, the culture that we were brought up in. It's a very unique and, and small community. They all still live in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn and New Jersey and in Florida. And our family, you know, came from Aleppo and Damascus. And Aleppo in particular has this totemic status. There's continuous Jewish presence there from the third century. There's the famous uh, Keter of the, the, what they call the Crown of Aleppo, the Aleppo Codex, which was a Torah scroll that dates from the ninth century that was in the great synagogue there. And so, you know, if you were to construct a Venn diagram of, on the one hand, people who can construct really fluent and beautiful narratives about globalization in the 20th century, and people who are Syrian Jews, it's a very small overlap, <laughs> in the, like mostly a, a very old publicity photo of me. Mm -hmm. um, and. So that, that was sort of my in. Um, he was a very private person. He had this remarkable career. He was born in 1932 into a banking family. They were third or fourth generation bankers. When he was 15, his father sent him to Milan with a 19-year-old chaperone, just like, go do business and start trading. Uh, in the early 50s, at the age of 22, he moved the family to Brazil, where he sets up all these trading business, finance businesses. 1959, at the age of 27, he starts a private bank in Switzerland. He comes to the U.S. in 1964 and starts Republic Bank, a startup bank that grew to the 11th largest bank in the U.S. Um, his stock, the stocks of his companies were public, 25% compounded return over their lifetime. He became a billionaire. He lived in some of the best real estate in the world. Um, and along the way, he was the protector and often the savior of the Jewish communities of Beirut, and in particular, Aleppo, offering people jobs, moral support, financial support. I was at a event in Brooklyn two weeks ago, several hundred people, and I, literally three or four dozen people who came up to me and said they knew him from Beirut, they gave him, when they fled, when they escaped, he gave him a job. Uh, a lot of dramatic things happened in his life. There was this crazy episode in the 80s where American Express engineered this smear campaign against him, and there's a 500-page book written about just that. He died in a suspicious fire in 1999. There are a lot of kind of conspiracies falsehoods uh, that flourished in his lifetime because of who he was. Um, what I learned was that <clears throat> there existed an archive of his papers, his family papers, his papers, with documents that are eight or nine different languages, Italian, French, German, Spanish, Arabic, Hebrew, Portuguese. And that after he had died, his foundation had got these people to go interview hundreds of people who knew him, from people who were in his grade school to Henry Kravis and Jacob Rothschild and all the you know, prominent bankers. And you know, I know Hebrew, I can read Arabic, um, I can muddle through all those other languages. And it was like dumping out a jigsaw puzzle with like 2,000 pieces, and you could understand how to put it together, but you had to understand how everything connected with each other. Mm -hmm. And it was 
comparatively easy to put together the financial story because the banks were publicly held and you had their annual reports. But there was a lot of code that you wouldn't get, right? That you, you, know, you had to understand why there was no trading of gold in the 40s. You also had to understand when in Arabic someone calls someone a hamor, that means a jackass, like why you would say that and what that means. And so there's a kind of code in here. Um, I knew what a lot of those things meant just from growing up and from my work. And, and Edmund Stafford was a very private man. There's like no records of him, television interviews, even tape recordings of his voice are very rare. So when I got a phone call in 2017 and someone said, you know, do you know who Edmund Safra is? I thought I, I did know who he was. And this, by the way, this is like a, a signed promissory note from his father's bank in Beirut, but it's, you know, it's written in Arabic and French. And this is the sort of thing you have to mm -hmm. decode. So the next thing, I know I'm on a plane to London and I'm meeting with um, his widow, Lily Safra. And Lily, of course, is central to the story, but how does she figure into everything? In the so narrative? she was a she was a formidable person in her own right. She just died uh, this summer um, at the age of 87. Uh, <clears throat> they got married in their 40s. They didn't have their own biological children. She was independently wealthy when when they met, and was a very shrewd investor in art and real estate. Um, opened his world to a kind of you know, social and political world. And after he died, you know, in typical for people who are Syrian, in their lifetime, they would never name something after themselves. They would always name it after their parents. Um, in the years since he died, like I said, he didn't have his own biological children, but she, through the work of the foundation, has been, you know, took his legacy very seriously. And if you, so if you go around the world today, there are literally dozens of Edmund Safra synagogues. Anywhere there's a Sephardic community center, um, the foundation invests in medical research because he had Parkinson's in education. So everywhere you look, the, the imprint, the footprint of this man's name is there, and it's mostly due to her. And so I sat down with her, and she, you know, had to kind of convinced her that it was okay to let me rummage around in their lives for four or five years. Uh, and, you know, she told me that other people had looked at these documents, but couldn't really tell the human story. And they, they didn't understand the richness of his life. They couldn't understand there were details, why his license plate always ended in 5555, five, 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 and his phone number in 5555, because five, five, five. the Hamsa in Arabic is the sort of mark of superstition, ward off the evil eye. He always did deals on a Tuesday, because in Judaism, Tuesday is seen as a better day. Uh, he had this strong affection with Aleppo, even though he never lived there. And, you know, he insisted, even as he built this multi-billion dollar banking empire, I'm holding on to his father's little bank in Beirut that he owned through the 70s, through the Civil War, through the 80s, through the Israeli invasion. He owned it at his death in 1999. It's called Banque Credit de Nationale, uh, and it still exists. And the question of why, when he had a ground groundbreaking, he had not one, but two or three rabbis. Like anything he did, there was a collection of rabbis. And so if you, you, the task was to sort of try to understand the motivations and details of his life that, that helped me put together this story. And your story, of course, is organized by chapters, and the chapters have either the names of cities uh, or countries appended to them. And I suppose the point that you're making here is that he was a man who existed in a system of networks and empires, and Aleppo uh, very much is at the center of this whole network. So what is the significance for him of Aleppo? So Aleppo was this, like I said, there had been a Jewish presence there since the third century, great rabbinic dynasties, very strong culture, a city that was kind of left behind by industrialization. There, in the 1860s, 1870s, emerged Safra Fred. There are four brothers, and the Ottoman Empire was like an integrated whole. So one goes to Alexandria, there's an Alexandria branch, one goes to Istanbul, one stays in Aleppo, and Jacob, who was the son of one of the brothers who died young, goes to Beirut. So Aleppo is where it all kind of traced back to where their identification was. Beirut was a very actually young Jewish community. There wasn't a synagogue there until the 20s. So even they're living 200 miles away, all the rabbis, all the touchstones, the melodies, everything they do is connected to Aleppo. And it dictated the type of financing and trade they were. they were. They were money changers. They were sending gold on caravans to Iraq. They were helping people finance trade. That was the type of banking they did. Yeah, and it also makes one wonder when one thinks about the five Rothschild brothers who in the 18th century and 19th century established that far-flung banking network, how important it is to have a lot of men 
in your family who are sons and brothers. And, and then can, who marry cousins and nieces and nephews, so you keep the equity in the business, which yeah. the Rothschilds did and which the Saffers did as well. Yeah. So um, obviously Aleppo existed in time and space, and in the years of World War I, 1914 and 1918, we have the Ottoman Empire collapsing, the map of the Middle East being redrawn, and that, of course, is going to affect the Saffer brothers tremendously as well. So Jacob, who is Edmund's father, that's the old guy in the middle, Edmund's on the left, these are several of his siblings, and his mother Esther. Um, he moves to Beirut in 1920, because Aleppo's done. Beirut in the 20s and 30s, it was like, you know, we think of Beirut as a, as a metaphor for dysfunction and hatred and lack of coexistence. In the 20s and 30s and the 40s, Beirut was the place to be. It was cosmopolitan. It faced the Mediterranean. They spoke French. There were Christians, Muslims, and Jews living in harmony. When the Saudis started to get money, they come to Beirut for the nightlife, the casinos. It was an amazing place to get connected to networks. And Jacob Safra, his father, comes and sets up a bank there in 1920 and is like one of the leading members of the, of the Jewish community, which is thriving. There's a, a big synagogue right downtown. There's a resort called Ale, which they all go to in the mountains in the summer. And it's here where he is born in 1932. Can you expand a little bit on the concept of networks? We're always told that we're living in a uh, world that's completely networked digitally and so forth. What, how does the yeah. concept of a network? Well, first, there was the, <laughs> you know, fitting into Lebanon. So this is a picture uh, from the <coughs> 50s. Jacob Safra, Edmund's father, is the guy with a tarbouche on his head, third from the right. That's the chief rabbi in the middle. That's Pierre Jamal, who was the Christian leader on the left. And these are Muslim leaders on the right, um, I believe. There was this, like, sense of coexistence. And Edmund's father was the establishment, like the president of the community. There was a formal organization. People effectively paid a tax to, to uh, you know, help all the organizations. So there's the Beirut network. There was the Jewish banking network. This is a, uh, from the offering of 1972 when he took a Swiss bank public, and you can see manufacturers Hamover and Rothschild. Um, I don't mean to drop names, but Thursday I was on a Zoom call with Jacob Lord Rothschild, or Jacob as I call him, and um, he was the investment Not banker Jake. on this deal. And at that deal, he stood up and said, our fathers knew your fathers, our grandfathers knew your grandfathers. They were trading gold in the 1890s and 1900s with the Jewish banks in London, the Mokadas, and the Rothschilds. So there was, there was that network. But he doesn't stay. He goes to Milan at age 15. So what's right. the, what's the so, attraction of Milan? So, you know, in 1947, it's cataclysmic year in the Middle East. Israel is founded. In Syria, there are pogroms in Aleppo. A lot of people flee. In Iraq, pogroms, like, higher population leaves. Yemen, they bring all the population out. <coughs> Morocco, people fled, you know, five or six years later. Lebanon was the only place where the Jewish population actually increased after 1947 because most of the Syrian Jews left and they were protected. They were part of the establishment. They had an armistice with Israel. Things were sort of settled. And yet, you know, there was a bombing at the school that he went to. There was a sense of insecurity. Um, Jacob Safra had four sons. Edmund was the second. Typically in those, that world, the oldest son is charged with carrying the family business forward. But he had identified Edmund as a prodigy. He only, he only went to school through the age of 14. That was the, the degree you got from the, the Allianz School. The Allianz Schools were these French-speaking Jewish schools, uh, which had its own network. They would take people from Morocco, train them in Paris, and send them to teach in Beirut. These schools went from Morocco all the way to Iran, Bulgaria, Greece. So that was like one kind of fraternity that he was mm -hmm. already a part of. Um, so Jacob decides, you know, we have to start looking abroad. We need a base abroad, and I'm going to send 15-year-old Edmund because I think he's a genius, and I'm going to send him to Milan. He sets up an account there with you know, a million dollars, which at the time was, of course, a lot of money. So they were, he was not a refugee. He was a, a businessman traveling. He sent him there um, with a 19-year-old chaperone. And there were like 12 guys from Aleppo in Milan, as there were 12 guys from Aleppo in the Philippines in Hong Kong, in Tokyo, mm -hmm. in Manchester. So you had this network of people you could do business with and trade that was a network of trust. And this is a picture of him. You know, he always looked much older than he actually was. He was probably 16 or 17 at this time. And when he gets to um, Italy, he starts going around and trading gold. What the Saffris did was trade gold. And in Europe, the price of gold was fixed. There was no gold trading. Bretton Woods Accord comes in after the war. There's no gold market. It's $35 an ounce. So no one would be interested in trading gold.
But if you knew how to move gold to where it traded freely, like Kuwait or India or Hong Kong, there was business to be done. And what Saffers did is they sent Edmund's older sister and married a guy who was a surgeon in Aleppo. His clinic gets destroyed. He's 20, 15 years older. They say, you go to Hong Kong. Edmund's going to go around <clears throat> the central banks of Paris, Amsterdam, and especially Switzerland, because the Germans, for some reason, put a lot of gold there during the war, um, and buy gold there and send it to Hong Kong, where you can sell it into the local market. And so that's the sort of thing he was doing. He was also, there was a, uh, the Maria Fallers. There are these coins from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and some of them had the likeness of Franz, who was the king, and others had that likeness of Maria, who was one of the empress. And in the Middle East, those traded at a discount because it was the likeness of a woman. Mm. So they would trade them in between Europe mm. and Beirut, taking advantage of the arbitrage. That was, so, you know, he became a banker, but he was really a trader. Mm -hmm. And you were going to say something about Errol Flynn, I think. Yeah, so he's running around Europe at the age of 18, 19, 20. He's going to the south of France. He's trading gold. And somewhere in there, he's financing Errol Flynn's movies. Errol Flynn is trying to make a comeback. He had been an action star. And this is a receipt from one of the uh, films, that he was the Field of Regiment, that he was backing. But he was also trying to make a very elaborate uh, uh, re restaging of uh, William Tell as a movie that flopped. And you know, it was one of the few business ventures that failed were these movies. Again, he was like 21, 22, and he was like financing Errol Flynn in Italy. So obviously, he had a lot of reason to stay in Europe. Um, he was close to the Middle East. He knew European languages. And yet, he doesn't stay. What, what was going on with that? So in 1952, there's, <clears throat> again, Lebanon, there are like periodic problems. At one point, the, the Safra family's apartment is ransacked. They still have their bank. And the father decides, we got to leave. And in the early 50s, you just couldn't pick up and go anywhere. It's not like Europe would give you citizenship. The US, where there were plenty of Syrian Jews who had come in the 20s, was not open to immigration that way. And again, there were like 30 or 40 Syrian Jews who had gone to Brazil. Brazil was an open country, open for investment. We think about like lots of former Nazis going there. But plenty of people from Lebanon and Syria, mm. Jewish, non-Jewish, were going there and built. This is an industrializing country. So he says, you know, at the age of 22, we're going to Brazil. He takes his father, puts him there. He, his younger brother sets him up to work with him there, takes one of his other younger brothers, sends him to boarding school in England. And he shows up in uh, Sao Paulo. And he's not a citizen, so he can't operate a bank. But within, again, within like 24 months, he's got six different companies. Mm -hmm. They're trading coffee. They're making jute bags, the bags that coffee go in. He's bartering. Brazil was kind of a closed economy. So he's bartering like soybeans and coffee for watches and industrial equipment from Hungary behind the Iron Curtain. And he's doing this because he has now has, in addition to being in Brazil, sets up a base in Switzerland in 1956. So he's constantly on the move. He makes his way to Geneva at a certain point. And you can't really imagine any place more different from Beirut or Sao Paulo. So what's the appeal of well, Geneva? The appeal of Geneva is that you know he loved the, again, he had like multiple, he had a single identity, but was comfortable in multiple places. He loved like the hurly-burly of Beirut cursing in Arabic and all that, and he loved like the order, the formality. His, he had this kind of formal way of approaching customers, and that fit very nicely in with what was going on in Switzerland. It was a very peaceful place. And there, he, people started giving him money to manage, and he basically set up a private Swiss bank in 1959 that became called Trade Development Bank. So now he's got banks in Beirut, financial operations in Brazil, bank in Geneva. And he's a peripatetic guy, so of course he doesn't stand still. He moves on to New York. Not only was he peripatetic, he liked to move around a lot. See? <laughs> <laughs> so he always had a feeling. He first come to New York in 1953. There's a big Jewish community here, but you know, in, in the 1960s, this was this country was sort of on top of the world. This bustling consumer economy. Right? The banks in Switzerland were for private banking, really rich people. There's a great middle class. Uh, economy going on here, and the story goes he went out one day to buy a hat and bought a uh, bought a building. This is a this is on the corner of 42nd and Fifth Avenue, so right right next to the library in Bryant Park. This 11-story building, it's called the Knox Building, and he buys it for three million dollars in 1963, and decides he's going to live in the top in the penthouse, and at the base he's going to build his bank. 
is going to start a new bank called Republic Bank of New York, which is an American-style bank with a kind of grand European banking hall. But this is going to get like the deposits of like middle-class people from Brooklyn who are going to come in and put their money here. And he was always amazed that it was so open that you could do business here. That when he opened the branch, Senator Kennedy shows up. You know, this is 1966. Edmonds there on the left. Jeff Kyle, who is here, may know who some of these other people are, but that's obviously Senator Kennedy uh, right there. And he had a very upside down view of banking. He saw Americans lending on credit cards and mortgages and car loans, lending to people they don't know. He thought that was crazy. In Beirut, you only lent to people you know, you lent them a little money, and they paid it back on their family's honor. There was no such thing as credit losses. There was no such thing as deposit insurance in the worlds that he operated in. If there was a loss, he would have to make it good. And so what he was doing, he was taking these deposits, and instead of lending it in the US, he would like, lend, make a loan to the Central Bank of the Philippines. And again, these are back in the days when countries didn't default. He would lend to uh, projects guaranteed by the Export-Import Bank, anything that had a guarantee of some sort that he could sleep at night. Because he felt like the deposit, that he was there to, to protect the depositors, not to try to make a huge uh, amount of money on his loans. Republic became known it's a television bank. And most people here, does anybody here know why? OK, so if in the 60s you couldn't compete, you couldn't offer a higher interest rate. There was a very sharply uh, constrained range. And you couldn't give someone more than something worth more than $10. That's like open an account, get a toaster. But somebody realized there was no limit to what I could give you if you came in and referred somebody. So the whole thing was like, you refer someone who comes in and buys a CD for a year, we'll tie up the money you get a black and white TV, which was worth three or $400 at the time. And so they had people lining up. And there was a woman named Ida Schwartz who referred 25 people and got 25 TVs. <laughs> and so Republic became known as the, the television bank. But he was always looking for the bigger stage. And that's one of the reasons he came to New York. This is a very poor picture. But he was talking to one of his nephews who was deciding what to do. He said, you know, do you want to stay here in Brazil? Or do you want to go to New York and meet David Rockefeller? which is exactly what Edmund Safford did. You know, like I spoke before about his networks, he had the Syrian network, he had the Jewish banking network, and he very quickly insinuated himself and was involved with the banking network in the US. Now, it's sort of a chicken and the egg question, I suppose, but when you point out in the book that Safford lived in several worlds at once, and he had, uh, and that was true in his personal life and his banking life, and he had a very, very international existence, how much of this is going to inform his banking, and how much of it is a result of his experience as a banker? I think the, you know, if someone asked me <clears throat> if this is a business book, or a Jewish book, or a book about a company, or a book about an individual, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Because in his mind, there was no, you know, in our world, we talk about like, well, a company has to have a purpose, but then also has to make money. Or you make a lot of money, and then you give it away afterwards. And for him, this whole thing was connected. Um, the Saffers were kind of like the aristocrats in their community, so they were responsible for everybody. Mm -hmm. He had that sense of responsibility towards his depositors. He owned 30% of the stock of these publicly held companies, so if anything bad was going to happen, it was going to happen to him first. He didn't really like to lend money. He would sort of prefer not to, and that's also what distinguished him from a banker. Like I said, there was no such thing as deposit insurance, and he never believed that if something happened to him, because he was always an outsider, that if something happened, that his bank would get bailed out by the US government. And people could never understand how he made money. His banks were public, they reported, but because they did things other than what typical banks did, uh, they did a lot of trade financing, they did a lot of foreign currency exchange, they moved banknotes around the world. These are the sort of things that like Citigroup or Chase weren't doing. And people never understood how he could make money while doing this because he never suffered a credit loss. And that's precisely because he had this very personal sense of we may not know each other, but you and I have a relationship. And the relationship is I'm going to take care of your deposits, and you're going to pay me back what you owe me. And he had this immense personal interest. Uh, people talk about how on the weekends, like he wasn't married until his 40s, didn't have his own children. He would call the people who worked for him and ask like, what different clients were doing. And so it's Sunday. They're not doing anything. You know, he had this intense personal. There was no like differentiation between the business life mm -hmm. and the personal life for him. And if you zoom out from his personal life and his whole personal history to, let's say, broader cultural or social trends, um, you write also how, as a Syrian Jew, um, he followed the tradition of acculturating but not really assimilating, that he can 
that he clung really to the rituals of Judaism, the deep sense of community and responsibility. How, how do you explain all that? Well, so he explained that he's talking to David Rockefeller, and then the next day he's putting on his tefillin, which he always did. So he was devoted to ritual. And again, the world he came from, there was no contradiction. It wasn't you were either this or that. It was part of your being. The way he treated customers, the way he gave money, it was directly informed by his sense of being not only a Jew, but a Jew from Syria, from Aleppo. They were leaders of the community. And as the community shattered, all the institutions, he essentially set himself up sort of in exile almost as the person that everybody came to. Um, So he was corresponding in the 60s. Isaac Shalom was like the leader of the New York Jewish community. He was corresponding with him in the 60s. Uh, they were talking about making donations to a, a yeshiva in the, that's in the old city of Jerusalem. He loved rabbis. He loved giving money to people building synagogues. Here he is like finishing a, a Torah. Um, anywhere there was a group of Syrian Jews or Egyptian Jews in Brooklyn, in Brazil, they would come to him and he'd basically say like, you know, you guys need $300,000, you, you sign a loan, and I'll give you the rest. You make the first payments, I'll give the rest. And he did this on a personal basis to like every synagogue you could find in Europe and the Middle East. Um, this is a, a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe to him in 1971. He gave not one, but two Torahs to the Syrian synagogue in Brooklyn, and that somehow is a very ultra special thing, which occasioned the the letter from the Rebbe, which is something that he treasured. And his philanthropy, it seems, wasn't really just about numbers or about the act of giving. It was about really being directly involved in people's lives. So how would you say he viewed tzedakah or charity yeah. from a personal So again, Jewish like in the archives, there are like letters from people who are, you know, we're in Beirut, the bombs are falling, we don't know where to go, what should we do? And he'll write back, you know, come to Argentina, come to Brazil, you'll have a job here. Um, the number of people I met at this event two weeks ago who personally told me about how when they came out, he gave them a job. So there's this very kind of personal intervention. Um, <clears throat> this is a letter in French in 79, and it's from the Rabbin de Alep, the rabbis of Aleppo. There were still seven or eight rabbis holding on. And it's saying, you know, you've helped us out. The chief rabbi who's d dedicated his whole life to the community is suffering. He doesn't have any money. He's sick. Can you help us? And of course, the answer was yes. And that writing I now understand is in the handwriting of Danielle Pinet, who is Edmund's longtime assistant and who is sitting right here. And so his response to getting this letter was, send them $7,500. And the archives are just full of folders like this. It's interesting also, if you continue on the uh, topic of uh, Safra as a Sephardic Jew, that um, it might lie at some of the root of his drive, by which I mean you refer in the book to how uh, Sephardic Jews have long been treated as second-class citizens, um, not only by Ashkenazi Jews uh, in the diaspora in Israel, but facing prejudice and, and uh, ignorance on the part of those who are not part of the community. Um, how would you have how would you describe maybe if that in, was involved in some of his drive to achieve, and how did he use his power to fight against discrimination against Sephardic Jews? Well, he was very focused on dignity in his life. Dignity was being secure in your person, that no one was going to attack you. Dignity was knowing that you put money in the bank, and if you had to flee, it would be there. Dignity was knowing you had a place to pray, to get together with people in your community. And you know, to be a Jew in the 20th century was to suffer displacement. We all know what happened in Europe in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but that happened to everybody in the Middle East at, a, you know, at some other point in time. And the greeting, the reception they have when they fled, was not always positive or good. And in Israel in particular, you know, someone came to him in the 70s and said, you know, only 2% of, of Sephardic Jews in Israel go to college. They live in these like, poor housing, et cetera. So he started a foundation called the ISEF, Israel Sephardic Education Fund, in 77 that like, just gives money to Sephardic kids to go to college and graduate school. Um, so he institutionalized it, and when he butted up against like, uh, the institutions in the US that weren't willing to help, he acted on his own. So the story is in 1994, um, <coughs> the last uh, Jews, Assad decides to let the last 4,000 Jews leave Syria. Um, and his conceit was, well, they all have to buy round trip plane tickets because they're all coming back. And the UJA, the Federation, they weren't going to like stump up the money to pay for this if so someone called Edmund Safra and he says, OK, buy 4,000 tickets, here's $4 million. 
he functioned as that kind of institutional um, backing that they often lacked. And you talk a lot about how he was uh, constantly on the move and living in multiple places. And in that respect, I guess he does confirm the stereotype of the Jewish banker as the rootless cosmopolitan who's always out and about shaping things, sometimes for good, sometimes from the perspective of anti-Semites, not for good. Um, how was he regarded by the world as this kind of a cosmopolitan? He was regarded, I mean, this, this was his self-image of himself as a banker, a formal Swiss banker, you know, in these types of rooms, always with the suit and tie. And there was always a great deal of suspicion. Wherever he went, he was the other. In Brazil, he was Lebanese. In Switzerland, he was Brazilian. In the US, he was Swiss. Among the Ashkenazi, he was Sephardic. Among the non-Jews, he was Jewish. And there had to be something suspicious about how he was making his money because they didn't understand how they did it. Mm. So he was always the subject of um, a kind of great amount of suspicion, even as he kind of joined the establishment. So again, this is a picture of the, the Knox building, which their headquarters was. And then over time, they obtained the land next to it and built that 30-story glass tower that wraps around it that was Republic's headquarters. So, you know, as establishment as you can get, and yet still viewed with great suspicion. And this is a photo from 88. They had this remarkable villa called La Leopolda in the south of France that they bought in the 80s. They renovated. They had two huge parties, one for all, like, Lily's socialite friends and the other for, like, all the Syrian people. And the days, the days after this, these articles start appearing in the press that Edmund Sanford's a drug dealer, mm -hmm. that he's involved in Iran-Contra, that the Kali cartel is coming to kill him. And this is the subject of this, like, 500-page book that basically they unraveled this. They traced it back. American Express had bought a bank from him. They fell out. He was going to start a new bank in Switzerland. And they decided to stop him mm -hmm. by starting the smear campaign, planting all these articles. And he basically started suing for libel. Through the discovery progress process, they figured out that American Express was behind it. They issued an apology. Um, but it was, again, when the first thing that people, you know, if you do a Google search or Wikipedia, one of the first things that peer, uh, pops up is that he was, you know, involved in some sort of ethical thing, which he mm -hmm. wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a canard. But it's a harbinger of some ominous things to come, because on the one hand, obviously, your book chronicles the fact that unambiguously, he was a business success story in every uh, sense of the word. Uh, and he sells his banks for, if I'm not mistaken, $10 billion in 1999 at the age of 67. So it should have been a storybook ending to a storied career, and yet? Yeah, I think any you know business success story that ends in started a bank with $10 million in 1964-65, sell it for $10 billion in 1999, success story. But for him, it was a tragedy. And it was sold, I said, for $10 billion. He wanted $72 a share. What's the significance of 72? Anyone? Four times high. What's that? Four times high. It's four times high. Like, these are the sorts of things that he insisted right. on, or maybe he didn't insist on. That's just how it sorted out. Um, and when he sold the banks, he was ill. Um, it wasn't something he wanted. He suffered a, a series of tragedies. One, the American Express attacks. Second, he was stricken with Parkinson's while in his early 60s and was, couldn't really manage this um, entity anymore. And third was his family. Any business in his world was a family business by definition. And it was always you know, his brothers. He had set them up in Brazil. They had built their own huge bank. And he kind of felt that this was an enterprise that was to be managed for future generations. Um, he sold, in 1997, 100-year bonds, which companies did not do at the time. He felt this company was going to be there for 100 years. But he was unable to kind of figure out a succession plan with his brothers. He was sick, and so he decided to sell the banks. And for him, it was a moment of sadness. A friend came from Geneva and said to him, Mabruk, which in Arabic is like, congratulations, Mazel Tov, what an achievement, so great. And he looked at her, and in French, he said, j'ai vendu mes enfants, which means I've sold my children. I've sold my babies. So this was a moment of sadness for him. But he was going to continue on. He had a deal with HSBC, to whom he sold the bank, that he could take his money and take a couple billion dollars of client money and start his own asset management firm, which he was going to finally name after himself, called Edmund J. Safra Management. He was going to set it up in December 1999, when he died in a fire. So I'm sure everybody in the audience tonight has tons of questions about some of the details and the extremely a dramatic narrative that's at the core of your book, but just to maybe give people one last tantalizing hint of 
one of the things you're trying to argue here. What is his legacy uh, as far as all of these larger topics are it's concerned? It's a tricky question because there's no operating business that he left behind. There's no, his companies were subsumed into other companies. Um, they referred to him as the, you know, he was the, he was the crown of the Aleppo community. So the, the, the legacy in that community is very strong. The foundation, which has built synagogues, endowed professorships, Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard, Parkinson's research, the footprint of this name is everywhere. Um, and on a personal basis, you know, the people who work with him will tell you that they tried to carry on the way that he did business uh, with them. And there was a line from a business journalist in 2008 when all the banks were going under, and the line was, you know, where have you gotten Edmund Safra? Because mm -hmm. he would not have countenanced something like getting bailed out, taking big businesses, and everybody suffering. I just want to add, Jeff uh, Kyle, who is a, a character you will see in the book a lot, um, who was the president of Republic Bank and worked with Edmund, he is here. Where is he? With his wife, Danielle Pinay, who was Edmund Safra's personal assistant for 20 years. And Jeff has a lot of great stories. Jeff was with a, a brokerage firm called Kogan Berlin Levitt and Weil. So it's Sandy Weil, Arthur Levitt, Roger Berlin, and I forget Kogan's first name. But you were, started working for them as investment bankers in his 20s, went to work for Republic, and became um, president. <coughs> Jeff, can you just stand up and say one or two things about what you think Edmund's legacy might have been? When, uh, when uh, my daughter, Julie, uh, gave me a call, uh, having just moved to this town, um, and told me that uh, Pat, her husband, had let her know that um, Dan was going to do a presentation at the library, um, I was thrilled. And it uh, brought back so many memories about the wonderful things that Edmund brought to my life. Uh, most of all, his uh, personal secretary, <laughs> <laughs> which today I would probably be arrested for. <laughs> um, and he uh, was one of the great, great things that happened in my life. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. Questions, comments, criticisms? If anyone has a question, please come over here so that we can <coughs> capture this and everybody can hear your question. Maybe I'll start us off with a, with a quick one. So it's a cliche in historical scholarship that sometimes, you know, the individual makes the times and influences the times. Sometimes it's the times that influence the individual. I think, speaking for myself at least, when one hears about so much financial corruption and backroom dealing and insider trading. He, Safra seems like such an ethical guy. How, do, how, would one necess, how, how could one explain the goodness of all the things that he did? Because clearly he's a product of his own time and place. And it's a generation that came of age under very trying circumstances, as you pointed out. Is there some unicorn dimension to Edmund Safra that just he's a one-off? or is? Were there other people like him, <coughs> and can we take some heart maybe that he's, he's no, I not think there was like, you know, there was a, um, and some, a lot of it's about like honor and shame, which are like kind of 19th century, almost pre-modern mm -hmm. feelings of like motivators of behavior, um, <laughs> your family honor, your personal honor, um, and also, you know, the evil eye, not wanting to get in trouble, superstition, like all these were part of his life. He's a very superstitious person. By you know by sort of Western and New York standards, um, <coughs> the you know in 1999 he sells agrees to sell Republic to HSBC for 72 dollars a share. In the spring of 99, there's a scandal involving, involving a guy named Martin Armstrong, who some of you may remember. He had a company called like Princeton Asset Management, and he was like a you know he had an investment newsletter, and he was basically running a scam, a Ponzi scheme. And at one point, this guy, Armstrong, had gotten someone who worked at Republic to issue some false statements accounts. So this comes to light in the middle of the deal. HSBC says, wait a second, we've got to wait. This, there's going to be some liability. 
And he goes to them and says, okay, well, let's figure out it's probably going to be you know, $400 million or so. Uh, I will take $400 million less for my shares. Everybody else gets $72 a share for every share they have. I'll take $400 million less so the deal can close and everyone can get their money and we can go on. And that kind of personal, you know, bad, something bad happened. It was theory, you know, their legal responsibility. But his idea was that it was not the company or the shareholders, it was actually himself. And I think that was a, um, you could say that's like egotistical, that's a conflation of the company with yourself, but it's like how he viewed what he was doing and what the role of somebody who ran a company was supposed to do. Yeah, and he used his power for good. Well, there's a question in the back. Excuse me, but we can't hear you unless you come to the microphone. Thank you. What happened to, what happened to the rest of the family? Did, did they follow in his footsteps? Did yeah, they, so he had uh, three brothers and four or five sisters. The older brother, there's an older brother named Ellie, who there's a, actually a document I found in the book, in 48 decides... I want to go off on my own. So they buy him out for $300,000 in 48. And he kind of worked in Geneva, um, kind of with Edmund, but <coughs> didn't do all that much. He had two younger brothers named Joseph and Moise who were in Brazil. They set up a bank in Brazil called Banco Safra that grew <coughs> into an extremely large enterprise. Joseph Safra just died about a year ago, and at his death was worth $20 billion. And his four sons are now feuding with each other over the future of that uh, empire. But you know, in his world, the men sort of went into business, the women got married, the in-laws not so much coming into the family business. So, But there's still a very strong, there, there is a Banco Safra, J. Safra Saracen, which is his brother's um, bank that exists to this day. Hi, Dan, great job. Can't wait to read the book, uh, very personal. Now, uh, two questions. One is, uh, you mentioned the Aleppo Codex. Uh, it's a great book. After you all finish this one, you might want to read that one. Uh, so question one was, was he at all involved in uh, smuggling the Codex out of Aleppo or involved in Israel with trying to resolve the stolen pages? Um, my second question is, uh, is his foundation still alive and what is it active in? Thanks. So the, there's a, a book by a journalist named Monty Friedman. Uh, the Aleppo Codex was this Torah scroll that was probably one of the oldest ones. I believe went to the ninth century. It was the like, crown jewel of this community. It disappears <coughs> from Aleppo at some time like in the 40s and 50s. And then later, bits and pieces of it start to show up in Israel and the black market. And I believe the Israel Museum has some chunk of it. But there is like some suspicion that he you know, paid to like retrieve it, get it out. I didn't find any documentation to that, expect, to that extent. He left all, most of his assets to the foundation when he died. So it's a pretty large foundation. It's based in Geneva. And if you go to their website, they're involved in, you know, again, medical research. So they give a ton of money to Parkinson's disease. That's why Michael J. Fox blurred the book, not because you know, it was a we were buddies. Or he was in summer like camp with us. What? Yeah. <laughs> that was Michael Fuchs, not Michael Fox. Um, uh, so they do Parkinson's research, education, you know, like endowing their endowed chairs all over the place, and then Jewish life. So not just synagogues, community centers, French translation of the Talmud, um, those sorts of things. They're active in 40 different countries. Some, uh, you're looking that way, I didn't know. Um, I would love to hear more about your process, your research. You had you made reference to um, Lily Safra kind of entrusting you with these archives because of who you were. And so I would love to know if it was like, well, what the process was in terms of accessing that and whether things immediately made sense to you or whether you had to, I mean, you had to engage in a lot of interviews in order for things to things to make sense to you. Well, Kenny, Kenny will tell you my process. I, I get up, <laughs> I make a mess with the coffee machine, <laughs> I futz around on Twitter, act like I'm I've witnessed some working. of this, the okay. lunchtime process. So, um, this is actually, it was sort of more difficult because it was, other books I've done have been on a more 
constrained subject or things I was reporting on where my notes were in my notebooks. And this, they sent me like a thumb drive that had, with the archive that was digitized. So it's literally, I mean, unfathomable numbers of pieces of paper and letters and rabbit holes you can go down and things that if I don't look in this folder, what am I going to miss? If I don't look here, what, you know, you're going to miss something if you don't look at everything. Um, in addition, there were these transcripts of hundreds of interviews. A lot of the people were no longer living. Some of them were still alive. There were other people I was able to talk to uh, who knew him, who read the book, who responded to individual chapters. And so it was a lot of um, just spending a lot of time reading and looking at things. And this was like sort of part-time over four or five years. And then you start with the earliest years, which is in some ways the easiest because that's, there's the least documentation. There's you know, speculation that you can really just sort of say, this is what we know about this area. But it's, the closer you get to the present, the harder it becomes because there's just so much more material. Um, and so it's a lot of it's just a process of like looking quickly through things and you know, having four or five different people read it to make sure that I wasn't missing anything important. C2? Okay, last okay. chance, everybody. Wait, bef what? before we wrap up. Yep. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank everybody for all they do to support the library, which is a very important institution. I want to thank Candy for arranging all this and not having friends so that people showed up. I want to thank Gav for agreeing to be my interlocutor. I want to thank my parents for being here and giving birth to me and raising me. And that's it. Congratulations. And on behalf of the library, thank you, Dan and Gov, and thank you all for coming out. Dan will be signing the books that you purchased or will be purchasing um, right down there at that table. Um, so if you could just create a calm line, we will get to everybody before the night is over. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>